I suppose to kind of kick off, um, you've obviously on record as, as saying what an influence private play in particular was, was on you at an early point in your career. Um, I suppose, could you just tell us a bit about what you were doing at that time and, and, yeah. and why it was such an influence? Um, so what year did Private Plank Was it 78? 78. That's what I th yeah, so 78, uh, I would have been about 16, I suppose. So in 1977, I was working, my first job as a 15-year-old was in a recording studio in the West End of London. And around about that time, um, I started to go to a lot of gigs, was working in Soho. There was this whole world opened up for me. I wasn't a fan of punk, but the post-punk world is what interests me because I've been influenced by, for instance, the more experimental side of the Beatles, like Revolution Number no. 9 particularly was something that attracted and fascinated me. And playing around with tape recorders, you know, I'd had bands from the age of 11, but then when my little band had split up, so when I was about 15, I started to mess around with tape recorders, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and cassette recorders, and and start experimenting with just uh, working by myself. So around that time, sort of 78, um, I go into a lot of interesting underground clubs, I suppose. I don't know if that still exists anymore because everything is so accessible. But in those days, um, it was a lot of word of mouth. And so you go to meet interesting gigs, you know, bands like um, Throbbing Gristle and Cabaret Voltaire, This Heat, Scritti Politti, Wire. And before these shows, they would play some great music, you know, and you would, we didn't have Shazam, of course, in those days, so, but you would hear these songs, you'd be like, I recognise this, I heard this at a, at a show I went to last week. And one particular song that used to haunt me and my old brother Andrew, who would often come with me and our friends, was Private Plane. I didn't know what it was called for a while, I'd be like, wow, oh, this track is so haunting and mysterious, and I had to find out more about it. And eventually, you know, asked around, people said, oh, it's this mysterious guy called Thomas Lear. And then, of course, bought a copy. I think it was International was on the flip side. And absolutely fell in love with it. And then found out more about uh, Thomas, that he was um, essentially a one-man band. A guy, really in his bedroom, just making, he made this record, put it out on his own label. And it was so inspirational because I've mentioned this before, but he really represented the punk ethos to me. Punk, you know, apart from the, you know, the Pistols and the Clash, but the rest of it I could sort of leave it alone because they were all so derivative, copying each other, the way they dressed, the music they made. But the post-punk era was fascinating to me because you had all these incredibly creative people, but all doing different things. Yet somehow, you know, at the time it wasn't particularly known as a as a, as a group, and the, the post-punk term has been sort of a, applied retrospectively. Um, but that handful of people, Thomas, as I mentioned, Throbbing Gristle, Wire, Cabaret Voltaire, This Heat, Gritty Politti, and others, Robert Rental, of course, the collaborator, and Daniel Miller, the normal, were a huge inspiration because suddenly I thought, I don't even need a band. You know, I was already going in the direction of playing around with um, tape recorders because of what I was learning at the Wolf Recording Studios. And suddenly this thought of, well, you just make these records in your bedroom, you put them out yourself. It was so liberating. It was absolutely liberating. And so I do credit, you know, out of all of them, really sort of Thomas, because he was a one-man band. 